uh, do apologize for people who are getting kicked out and coming in. Uh, we do notice um, the problem, but we're also trying to sort it out. Um, thank you in for the first session. I'd like to welcome everyone um, to Startup Grind, to, to Startup Grind, and um, like to share a few videos from our sponsors while we kick it while we kick off. Um, give me a minute while I queue in the video from our sponsor, and then we begin. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, yes we can hear you, man. You can. Okay. Um, let me share the videos again. Okay. So welcome again. Good morning, everyone. Um, hope you're having a beautiful Saturday. My name is Herman Sangiwa, together with Monda Zuma, we're the Chapter Director of Startup Grind uh, Pretoria. So we'd like to welcome you to Startup Grind Pretoria Chapter. Uh, Startup Grind is the world's largest is the world's largest community of startups, founders, innovators, and educators. We are all we are in over six hundred countries and uh, cities and one hundred. 125 countries. Our mission is to always educate, inspire, and connect the world's entrepreneurs and support the startup ecosystem as a whole. Our local sponsors are PayFast, as um, you, could, you have seen from the previous video, which is a secure online payment gateway. Get a gateway. You have a website or not, PayFast allows you to accept and secure instant processing payment in South Africa businesses. We also have Safruit, which is a premium juice product in South Africa. This month in uh, this month in Startup Grind is dedicated to recognize black leaders, and we are highlighting their powers and contribution to the community. And furthermore, we also broaden up the startup ecosystem in it. We hope we hope you will celebrate with us by attending special events, and also we we'll also like you to uplift other black leaders across the world. At Startup Grand Pretoria, we're excited to host Maggie, the founder of Motel Resource and its consulting urban planner, to, to Ranyak. Motel is a Houghton based planning and project management firm focusing on the development of rural and township economies. 
Maggie provides strategic solutions uh, in achieving, provides strategic, strategic solutions which achieve holistic and integrated development in communities. Uh, she's very passionate community-based planning, and she's passionate in local local economy development as well. I hope I've done justice to your bio, Maggie. If I don't, um, you may add more justice towards it. <laughs> thank, thank you for that intro, Heaven. You are perfect. Uh, hey, welcome. Um, without you, I would like you to continue with your presentation, and we, we proceed towards... Um, you unpacking some social economic research and All everything right. else. All right. I'm just going to try and figure out how to share my Okay. Just a right. I don't think the share button is on yet. It's not even an option to share. It's on mute. Yeah, it's going out. There we go. Are you able to share now? Let me try again, Herman. Okay. Not yet. Uh, give me a minute. I see. Hello, Maggie. Um, Maggie, no. please. I'm back. Sorry about that. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can see. Are you able to see me? Yes, we can also see you. All right. Should I keep my video on, or would you prefer for me to keep it off? Um, depends. If you have a good um, network on your side, you can keep it on. Um, let me just be safe and get it off. Just a minute. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Hemin and the team, for having me today. Um, and thank you to all the grinders that decided to join us today. I heard some of them were actually having issues logging in. So uh, for everyone that has made it, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, my name is Maggie, Maggie Zodetsi, and I'm the uh, sole founder and um, managing director of Motel Resources. So Motel basically is involved in developing township and rural economies today however i'll be touching a little bit more on the township economy and not so much on the rural economy so what motel is basically is the 100 black owned um entity i am it's, it's basically a one woman show if i may just put it bluntly like that and um like herman has you know um indicated i work quite a lot with the mining sector construction retail and NPOs as well. I uh, actually established Motel um, at a very difficult time in my life when I was very, very sick and decided, you know what, let me just stay at home for a couple of uh, months and, and try to heal and take care of my child. Um, however, I got quite a number of requests to assist here and there with packaging ideas, concepts and proposals and I just couldn't refuse um, to look into some of the work that I was requested to do, mainly by friends and family who knew my passion is in community development. And when I took a look at the request, I mean, it, it, it was things that I knew and I could see that they would definitely assist people's lives. Um, and as I walked through all of that and seeing the plans coming into fruition, that on its own sort of you know, helped me to recover. And, and get back on my feet again. And I could say three three months down the line, I had you know registered motel resources, and I was running as as a, a business um, formal business from there. So I studied at the University of Pretoria. I hold a bachelor's degree in town and regional planning. And um, you know when you study at tax, um, some of you will know 
you are exposed to policy, to land use, to all sorts of different facets that have to do with community development um, and, and decision making in, in South Africa. And it is only in the fourth year that you sort of decide what you want to specialize in. And for me, it was local economic development. And I remember, you know, some of my, you know, classmates asked me, is, is, is local economic development even part of town planning? Why didn't you just go and do social work? But I knew that I wanted to work with people and I knew that people were very, very capable of providing solutions to some of the issues that they're facing in their own neighborhoods. I'm not just working with material resources. I'm also the executive director of Ranyaka Community Transformation, which is an urban consulting nonprofit company. Yes, it is actually a company that runs with a number of experts. What we do, we go around and provide solutions to big companies that have big monies and they have no clue how to spend that, um, that kind of funding. We are already in 13 communities still counting due to COVID. We are unable to go into six more communities this year. But um, we blessed in, 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 in a way that we do, uh, we continuously get um, private sector coming through and saying, hey, this is, you know, uh, the amount that we have. This is the community that we're interested in. Are you willing to go in with us and, and engage the community there and assist us uh, uh, basically to, to spend um, some of that uh, funding? I'll share a little bit more about myself as I continue with my presentation. Let me just take you through Motel a little bit more. Um, the services that I provide there are more into socioeconomic profiling and socioeconomic impact and assessment studies. So um, what all of these entail is basically collecting all the demographic data and the economic data that is sitting all over the world and trying to make sense out of it and to plot some of the trends that are persistent in our communities, making it difficult for us to continue development and to, to, to further ourselves as humanity. Um, so when we talk about demographics data, guys, it's, it's just basically the number of people that live there, um, the ratio, you know, in, in, in gender and age um, and, you know, income levels and, and, and sorts of, you know, that kind of data. So think census data, think stats SA data if you're in South Africa. And then there's a bit of, bit of um, technical work that we also provide, um, you know, that is spatial work, land use planning, project management, and there I'll be surrounded by a number of um, engineers, lawyers, you know, quite technical people in the industry who would want, um, you know, town planning expertise. How do we perhaps, you know, increase um, you know, the number of residential dwellings in this particular estate, for instance, then I'll go out there and do the applications for them to be able to expand on that particular development or assisting them to extend a road or a sewer plant or whatever the case might be. So when I'm talking technical work, I'm, I'm referring to work like that. And then we've been getting quite a lot of um, request as well to do training on community-based planning, um, sustainable livelihood approach, the asset-based community-driven development. All of those are actually community development approaches that any ordinary citizen is able to um, adopt when they are trying to do their own um, projects in their own space or any other space where they're sort of interested in. And what these uh, approaches or tools rather, they empower community members to, um, you know, systematically or strategically, um, you know, ch and challenge themselves into becoming their own town planners, their own engineers, and, and not depend so much on government to come back and save them from whatever infrastructure or service delivery problem that they have. And um, the Pretoria chapter asked me to actually go through the town planning aspect of things, socioeconomic research and project management. I said today to Monday that this is quite a mouthful. And if I were to you know, talk about all three at the same time, I'll need three days because I need a day for each. Um, but I took a bit of time guys, and to really try and bring everything together. I hope you'll be able to follow as I move through. 
Um, and yeah, let's let's see what we got here. So what is town planning? I'm going to explain town planning as a profession. Um, and every town planner that you come across will tell you that there isn't really a standard definition of what a town planner does. And as a result, quite a lot of people are confused, including us as town planners. Um, so I thought for today, let me, let me try and take a, a profession that you're familiar with and sort of try and define what town planning is starting using um, architecture as, as, as a point of reference. So we all know that an architect would design a building. Let's say they're, they're designing um, a residential dwelling um, and then they will decide where the door has to be. They'll decide where the bedroom has to be. They'll decide where the bathroom has to be. And if, for instance, they are planning for a bathroom, they will ensure that the space is enough just for the activities that one has to do in a bathroom. So you wouldn't walk into a bathroom space and find a large area, then you look back to your architect and say, what is this for? They can now say, no, that's for you to put the bed there. And I mean, we don't put our beds in, in the bathroom. So what I'm trying to say is that as we are busy planning for our municipality, our regions and, and our country as a whole, we don't only dictate or decide where the roads and the clinic should be, but we also calculate how much space is required and based on the land use or based on the activity that will be done in that particular space, we make provision for all for all aspects to, to work together. So if Maggie? I... Yes? Sorry, Maggie, it's Monday. Uh, mm. Just a quick question. Are you not supposed to be projecting a presentation because we can't see a presentation if you were meant to be? Yes, I, I was supposed to be. Um, hold on for me. I'm sorry about that. It says it's sharing on my side, Monday. I'm so sorry. I'm going to stop sharing and share again. Can you see it now? Uh, not yes, we can see it. Oh, thank goodness me. Okay, I am so sorry you. about that, guys. So I'm I'm like, what on slide number five? <laughs> so sorry. Not a problem. All right, so I went through this and I went through that. Um and I went through our services and all the topics that I'll be covering. But you were able to hear me the whole time, right? Perfect. So I am actually on this slide. So I was explaining the first bullet there on this slide. Thank you so much, Monde, for that. Otherwise, I'll be talking to myself. Eh? <laughs> so yes, um, like I said, the, the architectural side of things, a lot of people are familiar with that. So I hope you get a sense of what we do as town planners. So if you are in Pretoria, for instance, your local municipality would be the city of Tswane. If you are in Joburg, then your municipality will be the city of Joburg. Then we also refer to regions or province. So there are town planners that sit on a provincial level who decide what each municipality should look like, the services that they should provide, and the economic sectors that they should basically be um, concentrating on. We all know that, um, on a national level, the president will come up um, annually to tell us, you know, through the state of the nation address, saying that this year we'll be concentrating on one, two, three, four sectors and channeling funding into certain sectors as well. So all of that uh, is actually part of the state of the national address is, is influenced by what the town planners on that level are actually working on. So that also actually brings me to the second point um, of the slide which is the level of influence it really depends where you are if you are in the private sector you'll be more influential in your real estate into your private development into mall development and and projects like that if you're in the public sector now this is the the, the best place to influence policy how rural communities function how township economies function and also where and how um, investors globally can, can impact um, the nation. And then the civic sector is, you know, 
basically one sector that doesn't have enough time planners because most people don't really know and how to use our our skills um, in this sector. But what a town planner would do in the civic sector, that is your NGO and your MPO space. Um, this is where we would you know, normally assist community projects to align to um, existing bylaws and existing policies within that specific municipality. Um, aligning with policy is not only good uh, in ensuring that your project fails or gets cut off by authorities, but also it helps you to get access to municipal funding as well. And I, I have seen that internationally as well, international funders become more relaxed or more comfortable with a community project that actually speaks to the vision of that particular nation um, or the SADC region in our case, or the agenda of, of the sustainable development goals. So I work in, in, in both the private and the civic sector. And I work nationally, not just in Pretoria, where I am based now. I have projects, um, you know, in PE, in the Northern Cape, in Limpopo. Uh, I think the only province that I haven't worked in, no, I've worked in all the provinces. I've worked in all the provinces. So it's, it depends which sector I'll be in. With the private sector, I'll be thrown everywhere. With the civic sector, I'll be in only 13 communities that I'm working with now with, with Ranyaka. So as a town planner, I'll act as a mediator between various development experts. Um, and that automatically puts me in a project management position because if, for instance, um, a, commun a particular community needs a clinic, I would have to liaise with the Department of Education to understand if it's a health need that the community needs, what, what kind of health? Is it psychological health? Is it physical health? So that I ensure that I call upon architects that are able to design a building that will ensure that everyone that needs to utilize this building are able to access it. You know, if it's for, um, you know, therapists, um, physiotherapists, for instance, I would have to make sure that the building has ramps for everyone that is using a wheelchair. I hope all of that makes sense. And after the whole, you know, building is built, I would also have to talk to the councillors of that particular community to make sure that community members are employed in that particular space. They know how to ac access that particular space and all of that. So I'll, I'll be placed in the middle of all these individuals and stakeholders that have to work together and come together and make this thing happen. So sometimes I actually call myself a psychologist because we can all imagine the number of personalities that I have to deal with just to get one project going. So there's different types of planners. Uh, you, there is your land use planners, which I call our police planners. So think about the title deed that you have at home. It restricts you from doing certain things. For instance, um, if, if you are in Mamilodi, you would be told that this is a residential space. You can now um, run a medical business on your piece of land. And if you want to have a medical business on your piece of land, you have to apply to get the rights to actually do that. So your land use planners will not only assist you in changing the land use of your particular um, space, but also make sure that whatever is restricted on your piece of land is enforced. So you will be fined um, in other instances if you don't adhere to your title deeds restrictions. Then you get your strategic planners, planners that write a lot of policy, a lot of frameworks and development agendas. That's why you have your agenda uh, 2063, agenda 2030 in the National Development Plan. Um, so those are the type of planners that actually create a narrative of what the country should look like or, or what a municipality look, should look like or what a, a small neighborhood should look like in the next five to 10 or 25 years. Then you have development planners. This is actually not a very formal term, um, but then we see a lot of planners increasingly playing in all the spaces, you know, becoming land use here, becoming strategic here, becoming urban designers there. And then all of this uh, is necessary to ensure that there is local economic development in a particular area. We all know that as we plan for all of these and 
all of these spaces uh, or introduce development in a particular space, it's usually because the people there have a specific problem that they want fixed. And in most instances in our country, it will be an issue of job, of unemployment, something that has to do with the economy. So even though there's a different types of planners, we all plan for the future. And as a result, we sort of more or less follow a similar process. And this is what the process looked like. Because we are the first profession to gather information from the public, we are able then to gather all sorts of information that helps other, other professions um, to understand, to fully understand what the desired future is for that particular community. And how do we do that? We go into communities, we talk to them, we engage them, we consult with them, and they will tell us, you know what? We want to transform Pretoria into an accessible area where people are able to find jobs, where children are able to you know, find education and, and all sorts of things like that. Then we gather all of this information and we analyze whatever it is that we found on the ground. There's different types of collection methodologies that we use. There's geographic information systems, GIS that we use. We use Stats SA. We use primary data by just talking to people. And then as we analyze all of this information, you can imagine it's pictures, it's, it's videos, it's voice notes that we've collected. So we need to analyze all of this and synthesize it. And synthesizing information is, you know, that just means um, we, we then interpret if whatever we have collected is positive or negative for the type of uh, project that we're trying to, to implement in that particular moment. I hope that makes sense. Communicating the vision um, to governing bodies. This is done usually through a document, a planning document. So on a national level, you will have a national development plan. On a provincial scale, you will have this as a provincial spatial development framework, SDF as we call them. On a municipal level, you find this as an integrated development plan. Um, and then as you go lower, you'll, you'll hear people talking about precinct plans or urban development frameworks or community-based plans and things like that. All of these documents, it doesn't matter where you are as a planner, all of these documents have to be approved by some governing body. You cannot just take a document because it looks good and has fancy maps and now go out there and develop it. It has to be approved by any governing body that exists in that particular um, state. So as you can imagine, the approval process becomes very political because we do have people on all these levels that I told you about. On a national level, we have the president. On a provincial level, we have the premier. On a municipal level, we have a municipal manager. And usually these are people that operate in a political state. So they always try, sometimes, not all, all the time in a bad way, eh? please don't get me wrong, but they try and make sure that when we go out there and implement our plans, they are also able to tick off their own political agendas. So their political agendas sometimes are not in line with what the community has defined as a desired future. So as a town planner, this is where you now have to play an advocacy role, which becomes really difficult to do because the community itself don't always understand where a town planner stands. Sometimes they perceive us as you know, um, individuals that are also trying to assist politicians to get their way around planning and around um, funding as well. So after approval, I will you know, generally call in a land use uh, specialist or a planner to come through and ensure that there is some enforcement happening in that particular space because I'm one planner that likes going in, planning for a particular community, implement the plans, and then exit the, 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 um, the community. But then after I exit, then I will depend on my land use planners, um, my fellow land use planners, to actually ensure that everything that we've planned for is adhered to. So you will, you will know, uh, you've heard about what we call bylaws. For instance, if we have planned for a recreational facility, and we have developed it closer to a school so that 
children are able to play there and have some play time. Um, however, after a while then, that particular space starts, you know, getting flooded by cooler box and alcohol and adults, a bylaw specialist will come through and evict um, the, the, the people that are not utilizing that particular space in a manner that it was intended for. So where do I play or where does Motel play? So Motel does the first uh, part of, of the planning phase, which is collecting, analyzing, and synthesis. That's the second one. And then also there is some advocacy role that I play as well, along with the team. Going into the second topic that um, the chapter has asked me to, to, to actually discuss today is, is the socioeconomic research. Um, and this is the lifeblood of everything that I do. I actually cannot operate in any community if I do not do my socioeconomic research. So what is socioeconomic research? It's, it's, it's a type of a science and it studies how the economy or economic activities affect or they are eventually shaped by social, social processes. So in general, it analyzes how modern societies progress, uh, stagnate or regress as a result of their local, regional or global economy. So I think guys from, you know, at this point, you, 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 you sort of have a map, you know, that um, sort of give you an, a, a good understanding that where you are right now, where you are seated right now, listening to this presentation, that is a space that you exist in. However, it is also part of a local um, community, which is also part of a regional and a global space as well. So no community actually work in isolation. So societies are, div are divided into three groups, which is the so social, agricultural, uh, sorry, and economic. It also refers, it also refers, socioeconomic research also refers to the way that um, social and economic factors influence um, our environment as well. So as a town planner, we are, or I am very or particularly interested in what is happening in my environment, in my space, in my neighborhood, and in my community. And Motel is very concerned, you know, because there is quite, you know, there's poor or lack of planning in, in our in environment. And that has created such a detrimental impact on these socioeconomic factors. So careful planning can also achieve the same if the goal is to create a detrimental impact. So I'm going to repeat this again to say that if we don't plan for our environment, we'll have a detrimental impact. However, with careful planning as well, we can actually have our goal as creating a detrimental impact. So as much as town planners are out there to do good and do well, we've had town planners in our past who configured or, or, or restructured our space in such a manner that it creates a detrimental impact. And I will go in a little bit deeper regarding that in the slide here. So globally, there is what we call the evolution of planning, um, which means that the profession itself is changing um, as, as, as we as a society change, as climate changes, um, and as perceptions change, we also have to change as a profession. And as a result, we have um, sort of moved towards you know, creating people-centered approaches towards community development and development in general. And part of that transition is also fueled by the fact that there isn't a lot of uh, green space or open land that gives us the luxury to plan from scratch. So what this generation of planners are actually doing is actually fixing the mess that was created by our, our ancestors, our, our previous planners. And in our South African context, we're talking about the apartheid model, which is a model that was employed by town planners to ensure that rural and township spaces actually don't have as much development. So in this instance, planning was used as a powerful tool to curb 
and to also restrict development. Loosely explaining this apartheid model, I didn't take the academic route to explain this, otherwise I'll have academia chopping my head off. I used what I call the, um, the hand model to explain um, the apartheid model and how it was implemented. So if you use the palm of your hand, I'm actually tapping my, the, the, the palm of my hand right now. If you touch your palm right now, that is the most rigid part of your hand. And there you can um, associate that with the city center where everything is rigid, everything is sorted, everything is planned, well connected. You have your roads in there, you have your social amenities, your hospitals, clinics, everything is in close proximity to the residential spaces or where people live. And these spaces were also planned in such a way that they provide close proximity um, to other parts of the, Sorry about that, guys. Something just popped on my screen. Is everybody able to see my screen still? Yes, uh, we can still see your screen. All right. Sorry, I just got rid of it. Thanks for that, Henry. Um, so these spaces were also created in such a manner that um, you know they are well connected to the rest of the arm and to the rest of the body, which means that now we're talking about um, you know city centers being connected to other economic spaces to. To, to other parts of the, na of the nation, to other parts of the world even. And unfortunately, in the apartheid system, these were only meant to be utilized and enjoyed by the white community. So if this was the case, then where were our black communities placed? In the further parts of your fingers there, you see where your townships are. I didn't uh, label the index finger and the middle finger because then those two could lead anywhere because I didn't touch on your rural spaces, your mushroom communities. So be creative there. So township number one could be Attridgeville if you're in Pretoria. Township two could be Sushangu then. Township three could be Mamilodi there. Uh, Mamilodi is sitting on the pinky because Mamilodi is fairly closer to the CBD here in Twanin. And then how were these um, communities connected to the city centers? Remember, black communities had to be far out of uh, economic activities, but they also had to be close enough to make sure that you know, they come in to do the work during the day. If you are from social movie, you'll know that the highway there is called the R80. And just to tell you a little bit about myself and how I grew up in social movie, I, um, I was raised by um, a single mom and there were six of us. So the situation in, in Sushan Wuve, we all know it's, it's not very pleasant. I'm the first one at home to actually attend varsity and make it. And I remember in the first year, I had to wake up 3 a.m. to get to tux, do my work and collect my assignments and then go back home. By the time I got home, I couldn't do much. I would be very, very tired. And as a result, I almost failed my first semester at the University of Pretoria. So luckily I was able to you know, speak to some of my friends who guided me and told me how I can actually access the university's um, accommodation system and be able to live there um, for free. I did my application for, for residence and I got approved, I was very relieved. And that was basically the only way that I was able to study and make it through varsity because I could have never imagined um, having to travel from 3 a.m. in the morning and getting home at 7 p.m. at night and still make time to you know, do my homework. But what that did to me is that it stripped me of my family for a period of four years. And as a result, I lost all my high school friends. And I thought to myself, as I was busy studying, is it really fair for people to leave, the, to leave their homes, their friends, and everything around them just to get access to economic activities and opportunities? And that is the main reason why now I'm running Motel Resources, because I'm hoping that through this entity, I'll be able to influence how township spaces function. Because at the end of the day, what are we trying to achieve? 
We want to have spaces that we can live with our families, where we can work, whether you're a town planner or architect or an engineer, you want to be able to be to work from home. And as a mother, I would like to attend all my son's soccer matches. And also I would like an environment where my son is able to play safely in the streets without me having to worry about much. So going back to that slide of you know, uh, the planning process, they actually repeated it here. Because I am one of the first professions to gather this information, I have realized that this is not just my desire. It is a desire that is carried by a whole lot of other uh, people that are still living in townships today in South Africa. And it is through um, the work that I do that I'm able to gather the information, analyze it, and give it to the private sector. I'm currently working, uh, for example, now with NetBank through a project called Proud of My Town. And what I do here, I create community development frameworks. Um, and these are like mini business plans for this township space and NetBank, you know, picks a number, 90% of the projects from there actually, and then they fund this. And I have been so blessed to be part of this process where I see um, community development frameworks that are developed by myself being implemented right before my eyes. So the advocacy role that I play right now is not so much about throwing tires and protesting and telling government what they're doing wrong. But it is more about empowering the community and telling them that these plans actually exist. And not only town planners can create them, but they can also create them themselves. So I teach them how to do this. And a typical example would be putting them in a room um, for a period of three to four hours, roll out a map of their own community and ask them, where are the good spaces? Where are the bad spaces? And where are the okay spaces that you still want to improve upon? And it is amazing the solutions that community members come out with. So through this training, um, I also help them to align their plans with our country's uh, frameworks and policies as well. Because one thing that I want, don't want to do when I get into township spaces is to create rebels or people that go against you know, what our president or where our president wants to take our country. So I always ensure that whatever idea that they come up with, I ask them, is this aligned with what, um, with, with the national vision of, of the country or not? All right, this is going to be my last slide. Um, when it comes to project management, I didn't look into the technical side of things but more into how socioeconomic um, research can uh, supplement the work that you do as grinders. Um, because as small business, we are the quickest and the most innovative vehicle um, that could change our spaces, that could change the economy. We know that we are the ones that are creating employment currently, especially after COVID um, for, for the nation right now. So as I would like to actually encourage grinders right now to you know, look into the spaces that you're working in right now, understand the people that you're, you're working um, with or around, um, do your socioeconomic research to understand the real community needs that are in that particular space. And as a small business, there is small things that you can do or introduce in areas where you're operating to start solving um, some of the socioeconomic challenges that we are having. Uh, we can start you know, plugging in our own offices in, 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 in township spaces or investing in some of the properties that are there. We are all entrepreneurs here and I am sure that if we put our mind into it, we can definitely make that change and find business opportunities for ourselves. You see, when you do your socioeconomic research as well, you're able to deploy the right team to do the work in that township space. Um, typical example would be, you know, a bad idea actually is a bad example to say, you know, we're sending a, a whole white team to go and work um, in a township to, you know, construct a road or a clinic or whatever the case might be. If you don't understand the socioeconomic um, 
fabric of that community. You will deploy the wrong team and your project will collapse and you will be familiarized with protests and conflicts. And this is not just a black and white issue, guys. Even if you decide to go into a Zulu speaking community and you use a Sutu speaking project manager there, not so much of a good idea. So understand the language that's spoken there, um, the gender ratios and the income levels of that particular space so that you're able to work a little bit easier. You see, when you understand what the fabric looks like, the socioeconomic fabric or demographics of an area look like, you're also able to employ the appropriate approach. This is like the Goliath and David's uh, type of scenario. If David didn't understand that Goliath is an uncircumcised you know, uh, male, he was probably going to get a sword out. But then that's what he called him and he perceived him as, and he picked out a stone and that was enough to get the job done. Delivering relevant services and infrastructure. We all know about all those white elephants in our township spaces. Beautiful, beautiful projects that don't get utilized by community members because there's lack of ownership. Community members generally do not accept or embrace any service or infrastructure that was put in there or, or imposed onto them without their involvement. So if you want to involve the community, obviously you need to understand what makes them tick. And part of understanding the community helps you to de-risk all the political um, shenanigans that come with any project. We all know that when funds are released, there's quite a lot of politicians that come through and change this or ask you to do that or force you to do this. So if you understand who are the key role players in that particular space, you're able to either dodge them or work your way around them. Conflict management and stakeholder management is very key in ensuring that your project starts and ends um, within the time frame that you have um, initially intended it for. So socioeconomic research actually can assist you to make sure that you spend less time in any project that you embark on um, when you consider it. I think I am now open for any questions and I'm happy to answer your questions. Um, hi, Maggie. Hi, Morgan. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, good. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Uh, even though I was jumping in and out, uh, dealing with um, fellow attendees who could not, you know, join in. And I want to upfront, you know, apologize for everyone who's been kicked out of this session and those that have not been able to join. Uh, but we are recording this session and we will be sharing it with everyone. Um, uh, Mr. Tezi, um, there's a question from Ebu. Um, you hadn't yet folded it, ne? Did you answer the question from Tebuko? So Tebuko is asking. Yeah. So Tebuko is asking us: uh, Does town planning identify land for commercial use in new areas, particularly particularly RTPs, and yeah. and where can one access this information? Mm. So Tebuko. Sure. I see. Actually, now that I've opened it, Tebuko has quite a number of uh, questions there. Um, can I just answer all of them at the same time? Please. Is that fine? All right. Okay. So does town planning identify land for commercial use? Yes, definitely, Deboko. Um, for any space um, to function properly, there's usually what we call the PIES, um, P-I-E-S. Um, that space has to be um, to fulfill uh, the physical needs, which is your infrastructure needs, your, your water, your uh, your electricity and all of that. So we will identify where all of that goes and the, and the pattern thereof. Um, and also the institutions that will ensure that um, those things are put in place. So for, for roads, for instance, the Department of Infrastructure or, or Road and Infrastructure will, will be involved there. 
And then the E of the pies then is the economy. So we ensure that the space is well planned for the economy to thrive. So commercial space definitely has to be identified well in advance. And sometimes we go as far as determining the land use that has to go. So if it's commercial space, we will say a mall here or an industrial area here or, or whatever the case might be. And uh, for RDP um, spaces, that has been such um, a, a challenge um, for us because this part of, of planning has received very poor attention, if I may just put it like that. Because remember the RDP came through just after we received democracy and then at that point in moment, we didn't actually have quite a lot of uh, black um, planners who knew uh, or who were qualified to, to do our RDP spaces. So um, you can imagine the socioeconomic research that was done there wasn't really on point. And as a result, um, you know, spaces where there's RDP areas now, it doesn't have enough amenities. It, it doesn't really create a thriving um, a neighborhood for people to work, live and play, and play like I, ha I had mentioned. So if you want to know um, in your area uh, or the RDP neighborhoods, where they are, where they're located or when they will be built, please visit your municipality's integrated development plan or IDP, or you can just go to your councillor and then they'll show you the location where the RDP house has to be built um, and basically any other information related to that. I see that the other question is, does the town plan a revisit the update model and try to redesign it? All right, so it will really depend um, on this. When we do, when we do our planning, it's, we don't always go and look for the update model and fix it or whatever the case might be, um, but, what most companies do is just they, they just work from whatever approach that they are happy with or comfortable with to implement in that particular space. So not all town planners are out there like myself to reverse the apartheid model, but then are more about creating or introducing new um, spatial elements that will ensure that that space works best. So. Um, let me give you an example. The city of Joburg has the corridors of, of freedom. And then those are to make sure that we actually close that gap, that finger gap that I showed you. Um, and we also have the breaking new ground to ensure that, you know, um, this integrated uh, communities, communities that have amenities in them, that have all the services that we need and also cater for different types of housing typology. Housing typology is um, the type of housing that can be allowed in that particular space. So that's why now you get your gated communities with a one, one bedroom house and next door will be a four bedroom house and double story and all of that. So that is just to make sure that there's not only spatial integration, but also this integration of communities with different levels of income as well. Can the use of white elephants be changed to fit a new purpose in future? That is such an awesome question. Um, there is what we call um, uh, repurposing, repurposing of buildings and repurposing of, of spaces. So um, I would actually encourage you to visit www.ranyaka.co.za. Underneath that, you will find a number of um, programs and the programs that assist us and my team under Ranyaka to do exactly what you're asking now is called Fix Your Space. So here what we do is um, we go around communities where we work and identify spaces that are underutilized or spaces that show potential but are not you know, uh, exploited enough. And a good example of this is actually a clinic that we are currently transforming into an entrepreneurial hub in uh, Stellenbosch, one of the communities that we're working in. So check out that project there, they will, I think you will find it very interesting and it will also trigger ideas in terms of how you can do the same for your community as well. And Usbu Siso is asking, how do you view the connection between apartheid legacy in township? 
and the Township Economy Revitalization. Wow, this is a very, it's, this is a very loaded question, actually. Um, there's quite a number of uh, strategies that have gone out, and I think government is, is, is now moving towards, instead of trying to um, bridge this gap, because it's a long gap, the R8 is quite long, guys. So we can't now introduce, you know, economic um, activities along the R8 to our, along our highways, because in some instances, it's, it's just not uh, feasible. It costs a lot of money. Um, and some of the land along our highways are just not suitable for development period, right? So government is now moving towards making sure that inside our townships, how do we revitalize the economy so that it functions exactly like the CBD, so that there won't be a need now for people to constantly travel to access whatever is um, located in the CBD. But also you must remember that um, our CBDs currently aren't doing so well. Um, there's overcrowding and the infrastructure is also dilapidating. So there's also some revitalization strategies that are helping our CBDs as well. So I could say that now the, the, the connection between the two really is, there isn't really much. What we really need to do is do things in the opposite manner because the apartheid model or the top, the, the, the apartheid model was um, there to curb development in townships we must then come up with strategies that will improve or promote development in our own townships, spaces where we can live, work, and play. So I don't see any other question. Uh, let me just jump in there, Maggie. The last part you mentioned, you know, strategies that we can use to just change our townships. Can you share one or two that you think we should be using? Let's use a case in point, Mamelodi. Um, and also with that, just broadly, what would you say as town planners could be done differently with the new townships that are, you know, that we have, uh, or to get communities to move more to being a way to like environment instead of having your Havarua, which is a complete opposite, even though it's a township just like so. Yeah. Look, we need to understand that um, even, even township development itself, there isn't a one size fit all um, strategy or approach to it because now as you know um, coming from Sushangube you know there's there's some township vibe or cultural tradition that I have that is quite different to what Mamelodians would have so we need to also recognize that in every strategy that we want to employ it needs to be actually contextualized to that particular township and and, and understand really what makes that particular township tick before we, um, what we call this, implement that strategy. Unfortunately, Monday, there isn't much um, that is out there that we can, you know, pull from the shelf and say we are going to implement this in in our our in our economy. Um, there isn't enough um, research done on our townships, and that's why I felt, you know, this is such a great opportunity to talk with grinders and to talk with with local businesses to say, look. At the moment, the change agents, the people that can actually make a difference here is you. Government is slowly moving towards, um, you know, making a change and creating strategies in our communities, um, but just not fast enough. Um, it's, it's not fast enough. And then I think that it, it has to be a bottom up approach that we implement and at the bottom day, who sits there, Monday sits there, Maggie sits there. So we are the ones that actually have to um, create that momentum and make tangible steps, aggressive steps in ensuring that our own communities work for us. I don't know if I've answered all your questions there, Monday. You have, um, I just wanna bring in Usbusiso uh, because we do a lot of work individually and at times we cross paths. Uh, so, yeah. Spoo, if you're still there, I've, 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 I've enabled you to just engage more, especially around what you've just posted on the uh, think, economic revitalization bill and, yeah. you know, the town planning expertise lacking. So, over to you, Babu Thank you, Monday. It's been a long time. You've been hiding, ne? 
Maggie has kept me quiet. <laughs> Maggie, thank you for the for the presentation. Um, so yeah, one of the comments that I just posted now, Monday is hundred percent correct. You know, um, I think Monday and I have been we've worked together, we've crossed paths, and we've been advocating for township economy revitalization. You know, and when the bill came out, um. I managed to just browse it, uh, you know, very quickly in terms of what the government is planning to do. And I understand the the theory side of it, um, I understand, but it lacks the expertise in terms of town planning. And I, I was just, you know, in my comment, I was just saying that it would be nice if town planners can bring their expertise to make sure that this bill is practical. Otherwise, we're going to sit with another policy, if I can put it like that, that is that lacks expertise and is it's just full of theory. Um, I think there's a big lack of expertise when it comes to um, the bill. And yeah, um, like you said, you know, as a person who's who's thinking about the who's, who's deliberately thinking about the apartheid legacy, I think you would be one of those town planners if you you know get find a way somehow to get involved with this bill. Um, I think it would make a big difference. And Monday and I, we both from Mami Lodi, and we already know. Um, about the reiterated center that was opened up in Mamelodi that was supposed to be a chisanyama slash laundry slash something. And now yeah. the building is dilapidated. There's nothing going on there. It's been stripped, um, you know, and then it shows you that when it comes to that side of life, the expertise is just not there. The theory yeah. is there because the intention is clear. We're trying to, to create it there. Um, get Mamelodi to become an economy, um, you know, but also at the other hand, we are trying to, uh, boost entrepreneurship and stuff like that. That is theory. We know it. It exists it's in the global entrepreneurship uh, uh, monitor. But there's yes. practical steps that we're missing. And I feel like um, you would be a good addition to those conversations. I'm not sure where the conversations are so far. Last time mm -hmm. I checked, the bill was 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 uh, open for for comment, and I haven't mm -hmm. checked who who the contact people would be. But I'm I'm happy to do that research and maybe connect with you. Uh, through Monday as well and I don't know I think you just need to be if there's a committee you you need to be part of that committee to bring in that practical expertise mm -hmm. yeah um look as we have been I've been invited to to sit in parliament as as one of the youth um representatives there um there's quite a number of I've been part of the youth charter you know for for the African continent and I, I've seen how, how much it drains me to, to have those strategic uh, conversations. Because at the end of the day, after having that conversation, you still have to come back home and, and get the job done. The conversations that go on a national level, if you're talking about a bill, this is, this is now a national policy. It has to trickle down to a provincial level, be interpreted down to a municipal level, be interpreted. And then it's just going to go all sorts of stages by the time that it hits the ground. It will be 10, 15 years down the line, 15 years worth of workshops, 15 years worth of dialogues and symposium. And, and like I said, I am a doer. I, I want to go out there and, and get on the ground and, and do less talk, you know? So um, that's why at the moment when, when Umonde was asking, what, what can we pull from the shelf and, and, and implement in our townships? I said, none, you have to, you have to you have to create it for your own community because currently what sits um, on the shelf is, is national policy, is, is, is provincial policy and, and municipal policy. And anything below that, it, it, it's just not there. And, and you will be told, well, um, if it's not in the document, it cannot be um, budgeted for. If it's not budgeted for, therefore we can't do it because that's how uh, our, our departments work in, in, in our country. So how do we then um, make sure that we bridge that, that gap to say, we are here in Mamilodi, and then how do we make sure that whatever we plan here is featured in the City of Twanis Integrated Development Plan? So I think here yeah, the conversations that we should be having um, uh, so would be the conversations around what what uh, planning um, strategies do we have in the IDP in our local um, municipal municipalities um, documents that speak about not township but about Atlejiville, about Mamilodi, about Sushanguve, and all these other townships? Because 
you will also be told that yeah there is something about you know about townships in in that document but location is not mentioned let me tell you something if location is not clear in any strategic document forget that's where you get the hawks coming in because there isn't a location that helps you now to trace where the money went and where it ended so that you can drive there and say yeah this this was done so a bottom-up approach i would suggest i would highly recommend and if there isn't um anything that is already available in your particular community create it develop it as a citizen you have every right to go and develop a community plan for your own neighborhood and ask um, for approval um, up there. Thank you for that, Maggie. Um, who is the address of Nogwazi? Yes, I'm reading Nogwazi's comments. Do you think introducing any schemes into township? Um, Nogwazi, that is basically what we are trying to do right now. Um, our land use scheme, what a land use scheme is, um, guys, is a document that enforces, uh, firstly, it dictates what land uses or activities should happen in a particular space. So land use schemes, schemes should cover an entire municipality. But then when you zoom into a land use scheme, into a township, it starts getting a little bit blurry and you, you just don't understand what is going on. And some of the schemes were developed a long time ago. And when you check the town planner that actually did that, died like in 2005. So that tells you that the whole plan was done, you know, before pre-apartheid, which is a big problem. We're still sitting with that pro uh, problem in, 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 our, in our country. So what should actually happen in Nogozi is that all these land use schemes should be revisited, ensuring that townships work better and that the land use activities that are introduced in our town townships are compatible enough when we talk about compatibility we're talking about um, a land use scheme that will ensure that a school is not close to a tavern for instance you know um those have to be compatible land uses if there's a school here across at least there must be a recreational facility um or something that will assist the school to to thrive a little bit more. So it's it, I think here it's a matter of going back to our land use schemes, um, amending them and working with them. But also, um, government has take has has um, taken out what we call uh, the spluma. It's also a bill, Susiso. But um, all the town planners in the country are complaining and saying, how is this helping us to make a change in? Our communities on a ground level so when something is on if it's a bill or a green paper or a white paper it's usually difficult to get that into an implementable plan that will change someone's life tomorrow we we can't keep waiting guys for good things to happen in our township um thanks maggie um an email of one of my colleagues who could not join um, so they're asking um, what what are making guiding to development um, are you familiar with what's happening there with the main proof uh, mega city yeah I I've been I've been watching what Bowen is doing and I am for Bowen and I am very happy with the work that they're doing. Um, I'm very interested to see what Moiklu will look like in the next five to ten years because we've we've had some great developments um, uh, implemented in the country and um, Cosmo City being one of them. I don't know if this is a good. Uh, comparison to to Moiklof, but this is a mixed use development. This is a development that is, like I said, it's, it's just not bringing infrastructure, like top notch infrastructure, to to people who would have not uh, had access if 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 uh, government and private sector didn't come together and 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 create something, you know, together. 
So I, I, I love the whole concept of mixed use um, because it brings development to the people and it also you know, creates what we call social cohesion. So different people of different color, different age, um, different income levels, you know, can enjoy a space together. That's that for me. That's that's the South Africa that I I would really like to see. So um, it it's only time that will tell um, how things will progress in the future. Um, but then this is one development that I'm looking at closely and saying, Lord, I just pray that the private sector comes in very strongly and 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 takes charge and takes control and for once government enables private sector to um do what they do best by ensuring that there's policies that enables more of this and that more funds are actually directed is to ensuring that more of our people are getting access to good housing and and, and facilities as well so yeah that's that's basically my thoughts um it's, it's a positive feeling um, and a positive vibe that I have towards this development here. Okay, um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy you have a good feeling around it. Uh, but the, 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 the yeah. second part to that was, what, what do you think about the, the you know, the, the voices, you know, the distant voices around black involvement or a new partner in that regard? But I want us to look at it to say the various developments that are happening, the role of black town planners, you know, including other professions in the construction sector. Do you think you guys have a voice and how how do you foresee the future in terms of your involvement as a, you know, a black town planner in such a development of what is it, 84 billion? Uh, can we hear your thoughts on the involvement of black professionals? Um, look, I'm going to talk um, about uh, small businesses first because I believe that as a black as, as a black town planner, there's enough um, opportunity for me to um, engage in, in in such projects. I I believe that if I wanted to be part of such a project, I stand um, equal chance um, because I've got the expertise, the knowledge um, of you know, how to, to go about um, getting involved in that particular project. And I believe that I'll be able to deliver. However, as a small company, it's difficult um, to get in because of all the compliance issues, um, you know, that, that are required for, for one to be part of such a huge development. Um, so there is some degree of exclusion, um, but then I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, associated with the fact that I'm black or female, anything like that, but the fact that my company is small and just, you know, can't reach some of the, the, the minimum requirements um, that that um, the whole construction sector has for us to, to, to participate effectively there. Okay, um, before I, I have a follow up, um, uh, giving you the right to, to 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 ask your question. I see you have a follow up, and I have a feeling that mm. there, there mm. might be a, a lot more behind it. Uh, so, Nogazi, yeah. if you can be able to ask your your question and mute yourself, um, if you prefer that, maybe answers it uh, based on what you wrote. We can do it, but over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Hi, Maggie. Actually, you Hi. presented um, this week, so I was very interested in, in the conversation, so I just wanted to join this. And I'm very interested in the work that you're doing in terms of community planning. And um, it's very you know, commendable that you have started your own business, but there's a lot of people who are living in townships that maybe do not have access to um, opportunities in which they can start their own companies and things like that. So. I was, I, my question essentially was, how do we then accommodate the informal sector? You know, a lot of people who are like dealing with um, just informal trading on the side of the road and things like that. How do we inf uh, accommodate that informality in 
the formalized planning that we have in this country. So essentially, you know, looking at land use schemes and how fixed they are. Yeah. How do we, you know, kind of combine the two? Yeah. Um, look, I'm going to address the, the first part of your question. I should have known um, that I'm dealing with a time planner here, seeing all the land use scheme questions that I'm getting from you. Um, and thank you, thank you, Nogwazi, for joining me again. First day was, um, we, we had a good, had a good lecture there. Um, I, I mentioned the, the, the area of training that I also uh, cover uh, under Moteo. And under our training, I do your community-based planning approach, your ABCD, which is your asset-based community-driven development approach. And these are all approaches that I train ordinary community members on. Um, and it, it's usually non-planners, um, people who didn't even know that there's town planning um, that exists out there. The main reason why I do that is um, for community members to understand that you don't need a town planning de uh, degree to get up and to you know start solving some of the community issues um, in your own space. Um, I always say that um, if there is a problem in a specific community, it does not matter how poor they are, if it is a need that they have, is a strong need that they have, they will fix it. And that's why you see all these informal bridges in, in rural spaces. And that's why you, we have the concept of a stock failure, you know, in our communities, because there was a financial need, there was a need to save, there was a need, um, you know, to put money aside so that we can have food at the end of the year. So community members, I, I don't like saying they are smart. We, we are smart because I am also a community member some way, you know. Um, I always go with that mentality to say that there is already something happening in that particular community. And as a town planner, I just come to piggyback on that because if there is a community project that is already happening in that particular space, it doesn't matter if it's thriving or not. Um, it just shows me that there was a need, someone in the community identified that need and then sought a way to, to solve it. And those are the projects that I do. I do not reinvent, reinvent the will. I just piggyback on what community members are already developing for themselves. So now, I hear some people going on. Wanda, did you wanna say something? No, no, are you done? No? No, no. I just need to get to the actual question now. I was just walking my way through it today. Um, you cannot, um, Nawazi, uh, talk about township economies without without mentioning the informal sector. Um, and that's where it all starts. That's where it all starts. I mean, like I said, now, if you want a community project to thrive. You need to check what it is that they have already established because if they have established that that means there's already a need that they have identified and they are moving towards resolving it so we can now come into informal um into townships and and try to bypass the informal sector because this is a sector that was implemented by the community itself because they've identified this need and they are trying to resolve it so we just have to make sure that we understand how this sector works and find ways to formalize it. But we also have other uh, planners that say, or economists that say, should we really formalize the informal sector? Because then it won't be the informal sector. If it becomes the formal sector, it's going to exclude thousands and thousands of people who only have the resources to play in an informal sector. So that one is, is quite tricky because you do need um, sectors to be formalized so that they can pay tax, so that they can generate revenue for the municipality, so that the municipality is able to build more RDP houses. But at the same time, if you formalize it, you are creating some form of exclusion to Ugoko who can't read or write and will never be able to have a CIPC registration for her spinach selling stall in, in, in the community. So as a town planner, I'm going to challenge you that we actually have a look into, into our informal sector 
and, and, and find ways into integrating all of those informal um, activities into our own land use schemes, because it is important to, to plan for our spaces and townships and make sure that they are organized, if that's the word um, for it. I hope that answers your question, otherwise. Yes, it does. Thank you so much, Maggie. All righty. Uh, th thank you, Nawazi, for that question, and when I'm ready for the answer, hmm. um, as she getting ready to wrap up. Uh, so, Maggie, do hmm. what is your business motivation or inspiration? You know, what keeps you going? You know, as motel resources, especially with how you know the economy is. So, what keeps you? You know, every morning saying. I will wake up, I will go into different communities, whether via the Ranya. Yeah. Um, I always say to people, I work with um, NGOs a lot. I work for NGOs, um, but I'm not an NGO. <laughs> I am not an NGO. And the reason why I'm saying that is that I also have my own personal aspirations um, and then helping communities is just part of that. Um, what keeps me is just, you know, to make sure that I take my family out of this cycle of poverty. And someone would say, but then you could have done that in a normal job in a municipality somewhere. Why are you not there? Um, the reason why I'm running Motel right now is actually to preserve my health. Um, you know, the eight to five um, system takes a toll on my body, on my health, on my psych. And I just, you know, needed to branch out and, and run a company of my own and be able to work from home and be able to paint when I needed to, be able to travel when I needed to. Um, technology has made it possible for me to work anywhere in the in the country and that makes me happy that gives me the energy and 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 that goal you know and since i have that energy i just don't sit around and do nothing ab about it i go into those communities and generate all these workshops and we do all these planning and and that, that's basically uh, my sort of cycle of of, of energy and where, where it comes from um when when i found out that I owned a company because I didn't register motel. A friend of mine actually registered for, for re registered motel on my behalf because I was still um, very ill at the time. And I said to her, please don't register me while I'm still not okay. And she said to me, you've been telling me that you're going to register a company for the past three years now. I'm going to do it for you. So I was sitting in bed and I got all sorts of SMSs because I had already given her my my details to say when I'm ready, carry on and, and help me register here. So um, I'm very grateful that there is, there is a vehicle or an entity that I'm doing this work through, but this is really just my life. Um, this is my day-to-day -day routine. I just go out there, look for um, problems that I can solve um, and, and learn from solutions that I get on the ground and implement them on the other side of the country as well. Okay, thank you for that, Maggie. Um, a question from, oh, okay, <laughs> from my niece. <laughs> so she's asking, what advice would you give to, 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 to someone who wants to, you know, be a town planner, um, especially if, Oh, okay, so basically she's considering town planning, uh, yeah. but in, she thought of it as you need to be employed by government and did not know that you yeah. can have your own business. You. So advice on anyone who wants to venture into that space, what, you know, what should they be studying towards or, you know, building themselves towards and for them to get to a point where they own their own business. Um, and bringing in earlier, you mentioned that for small town planners, it's very difficult to get this mega projects because of compliance. Mm -hmm. So starting at tertiary level, what you know, what advice would you give and to someone to be better positioned as a small business to get those mega projects? Uh, your advice, please. Um, look, I'm not sure how old your niece nephew is, but I'll start it off from 
uh, high school. Um, look, I, I enjoyed geography at school, and I think that helped me a lot because I, you know, thought about space a lot. I thought about, you know, transportation, infrastructure, and things like that. And those are the things that used to bother me because being in a township, obviously, you, you go with lack of them. Um, but when you get to varsity, I know the requirements to be um, a town planning student are not really that high as long as um, you got good marks, um, you know, in maths and science. Um, you actually don't have to do um, scientific modules to, to, to enter town planning, but please just double check. I did my degree like many months ago. Um, and I spoke to a, a honors class at the University um, of Pretoria, Nogwazi is actually um, one of the honors students there. And they were asking the same questions. How do you then start um, your own your own company as, as a town planner. Look, it's, it, it really depends the type of person that you are. Uh, you need to look at your pers personality first. Um, I, I knew that I needed to work with people. So I knew that I couldn't be a town planner that sits in, in an office with three screens and, and fancy softwares and, and doing maps and things like that. And, and I... I I love my town planners, my fellow town planners that actually do that type of work. It's very necessary, um, but it, it's just not for me. I wouldn't be able to sit in the office um, and, and just do maps, you know, and I wouldn't also be able to sit and just do policies um, because I'm just not that person. So if if you're more of a of an activist and a revolutionarist and, and, and that type of person, then Perhaps being a policy analyst and, and a policy maker in the town planning spaces for you. And if you love development and big uh, buildings and your more roof type of buildings, perhaps then you can go more into a, a land use type of a planner. And please note that there's different universities also that provide town planning um, our courses. And in, 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 in the University of Pretoria, it's, it's more of your strategic planner. You know, people that write a lot. In your UJ, it's more of your land use um, type of syllabus that they provide, which is great getting students out there. Already in your second year, you know how to do a land use application, which is awesome. And VERT is sort of touching, you know, a little bit on, 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 on both of those. But when you leave university then, um, you also need to decide, do I, want to, do I want to go to the municipality? I do have a, quite a lot of friends who are in the, in the municipality that say, look, I mean, we need something exciting about our lives. I mean, we just sit in the office for many, many hours. Um, we, we just don't feel that our brains are working enough um, when we're sitting in the municipality because there's a lot of backlog, there's a lot of politics um, hindering our creativity and our work as town planners. Um, in the private sector, it's a dog eat dog world. It's very difficult um, and then you don't make as much money as if you were in the municipality so there you must really be driven um by passion you know in my case it's a matter of health you know i know that if i leave my company and work for a municipality i'll probably be miserable um and you know it's, it's best that i that i retain my health and and, and work for my own company and my and, and do my own thing but then um, running your own company is very, very difficult. Um, it's not a child's play. You need a lot of support around you. You need quite a number um, of people around you that will pick you up um, when you fall because it does happen. Um, so it's, it's, it's very, very important that you check your personality first um, before you choose exactly where you want to branch out. So if you're in school, might as well just start having that mind map already of where you want to end up and choose a university that will lead you towards that. And um, yeah, get, get to talk to as many town planners from different sectors, different levels, as much as possible to hear how they feel about their day-to-day -day working environment as well. Thank you for that. Um, I'll be a good uncle today. <laughs> um, 
And then the last one from my side, Maggie, uh, COVID-19 has disrupted the way we, you know, we, we live, you know, the way we do business. Uh, you do a lot of work with uh, grassroots uh, businesses, for example. So what is your advice for one to be better positioned going forward in business? Uh, some of the things that you might say we need as entrepreneurs or people considering to go into business, you know, we need to do in order to survive not only COVID-19, but any other, you know, pandemic or destructive thing that can happen. Um, we are seeing what's happening in Nigeria, you know, with the, for our curfew. So how can we be better positioned as en entrepreneurs to say, let's kind of fall through our businesses so that whatever thing that comes, we are in a better position to ride the wave and just your practice that you know comments in jay to to everyone in terms of business and anything else that yeah um look monday i did i did um talk about um the issue of compliance um that it's you know it serves as a hindrance uh, uh to 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 motel let me just put it bluntly like that um but I'm I'm not bitter about the fact um, because I've I've made um, relationships and connections and networks to big businesses that are actually compliant and that is how I managed to go through COVID and come out still crawling I'm still there you know um, so it, I would advise every grinder out there to you know, make treaties, make relationships, partner up with all these big companies and, and, and make it formal. I don't make it informal, make it formal to say, I'm a small business, I'm not a compliant, I'm, I'm not where I need to be, and this is where I want to go. Um, are you willing to um, work with me and, and help me through this? And some of um, these companies would have your enterprise development um, funding, or, or programs that they run, um, or, or just donations um, that they give out as well. So uh, find out, you know, how you can apply for those and get access to those. But I'm I, I'm not one to go out and wait for an application process to open, you know. Uh, so I would go out to these companies and just knock on their doors or do cold calling and and, and ask, you know, how can you help me? But then the the biggest question is how can I help? Because remember, as a small business, I, I move quickly, I'm flexible, I'm innovative, it, which is something that big businesses don't have. So I usually look at, you know, my potential mentor and see where they lack and then present myself. And so it's, it's more like a pitch to say, I can do one, two, three, four things for you. And as a result, I need you to push in me with one, two, three things. So in, in um, during the whole COVID-19 season, I was at home, I was operating my business literally from my living room and I was managed to get things done and I managed to continue changing the lives of the people that I connected with, not as much as I had before with you know physical contact, but at least 50% of the work was done. I mean, most of the food parcels that I needed to make sure got um, to, to communities. They were all donated by NetBank, which is a great client, really a huge client. And I'm thinking to myself, how in the world am I going to make sure that I get these food parcels there? And through the relationship and, and, and the contract and the formal contracts that I wrote, um, that I signed with, with the South African Army, I was able to pick up that call and say, hey, Major so-and-so, are you able to assist? Because you already have soldiers deployed in those areas are they able to assist me to deliver food parcels and we got hundreds and hundreds of food parcels coming out as a result so in a way business kept going solely because of the relationship that i managed to secure last year september can you imagine so don't um don't think because you're not compliant you're small and you hide yourself and feel embarrassed about it go out there expose yourself and make as many friendships as possible because you have no clue when those will come in handy, right? And my last two cents, Monday, would be grinders, please, 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 um, let's go out there and let us make that um, conscious decision to, to, to buy local, to, to hire local, to build local. I got an opportunity to meet a gentleman called Uset Mazurugo, 
who was the youngest guy who was throwing stones, catching to me, you know. And he, he said, uh, just in profound words to me, it would be, you know, we were the stone throwers of, of that generation and we got what we wanted. And you guys, your stones are, are education, you know, today. So don't be the stone throwers, be the stone collectors and start building your own community. So as a black leader, if there is any revolution that I want to lead, this is it right here. Township revitalization and making sure that our township economies move forward. Uh, Maggie, thanks a lot uh, for those words. Um, I believe in, in us, you know, changing the status quo or challenging it. Um, and I will take that saying that uh, let us build from those stones. Um, as Startup Grand Pretoria, we are honored, uh, you know, to have hosted you, Maggie. Um, you know, your insight is really, very, very valuable. And I'm hard, you know, I'm very sad that um, of, our, of, of our people, I think we have less than 5%, you know, who could join us today. Yeah. Um, but uh, between myself, uh, you and Hammond, we must do a follow-up uh, session um, so that we can ensure we unpack some of the things. Yeah. But as part of Grind globally, we were celebrating and continue celebrating black leaders, and this is in light of, you know, Black Lives Matter, and we know as black people the hardships that we have out there. As start of Grind, we are not just having Umegi, you know, in this month, we have black leaders throughout the month. But thanks to our sponsor, Google for Startups, they wanted us to dedicate this for us to take a stand to say, as business, we cannot shy away, we cannot, you know, close our eyes to the injustice that is happening to black lives. And to we thank you for your insight, maybe to, to our sponsors, you know, here in South Africa, pay us. We thank them, you know, um, for having been with us and continue being with us. To all our partners, Vibe Scout, Venture Brand, Mamelodi Fest, Kasi Hosting, uh, Safe Food, the premium brand, you know, we thank them, you know, for ensuring that, you know, we, we stick to the three things that we want people to, to walk out of any session that we have to say, has someone been educated, you know, in one area of business or whatever topic? Has someone been inspired to continue their journey? And thirdly, how do we ensure that we keep entrepreneurs connected? We know our network is our network. And as part of that, we will continue to ensure that we connect as entrepreneurs and make it so tasty. Thanks a lot. And to you and the Motel Resources team, um, keep up the good work with, you know, with the Ranyaka vehicle. Please do continue going into those remote areas. We need people to get, you know, um, such programs that you are rolling out uh, that can help them. I know um, we met through such a program, uh, but uh, I appreciate your work. And from me, Mondezuma, the Startup Grand Chapter Director, have yourself a blessed, blessed uh, weekend. Be safe, guys. COVID-19 is real. Uh, we know there's talk of, you know, uh, a second wave. Um, so let's ensure that we, we take care of ourselves, our employees, our families, and we ready our business for the new normal. So Hemen Singh, you are over to you, Megi Kalebowa. To all the participants, thank uh, you. I thank you. And God bless all of us. The parting shots from you, Hemen, but I'm done. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank, thanks everyone for coming through. And i also like to thank uh, our presenter today, Mikey. Uh, today's uh, session was quite in insightful. Uh, basically, uh, personally for me, uh, being a person coming from a different sector, I felt like this was um, um, something that's very insightful and made me think in a, in a different perspective about everything. And for all the attendees who, who came through, uh, we'd like to take the time out and um, appreciate um, the, the time that you took to come through. And uh, we do apologize um, if some of you kept on getting disconnected. Uh, this is a new platform we're having and we're doing a, a bit of new testing and um, um, developing it through as it goes through. So we do apologize, but um, definitely we'll do better the next time. And um, a word from, from our sponsors as well, we'd like to appreciate everyone. And I would also like to play a video from our sponsor and wish you all a very good uh, weekend and thank you very much for participating.
Thank you. 